day. I'm Liesl Petorius, Legal Advisor to Freedom of Religion South Africa, or 4SA for short. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, fellow Legal Advisor, Daniela Ellebeck, and we'll be talking about the controversial hate speech bill. So, to start off, Daniela, let's recap. What is the hate speech bill about? Liesl, so the Prevention and Combating of Hate Crimes and Hate Speech Bill, commonly known as the Hate Speech Bill, is a proposed law. And what it wants to do is criminalize hate speech with a jail sentence of up to eight years. All right, now, when something proposes criminalizing something, you should ask what it defines it as. And that's where the purple hits the fan. And the bill is problematic and controversial, primarily because of how it defines hate speech. Because the definition it proposes for this proposed crime of hate speech is not only too wide, but unclear as well, or as attorneys would call it, vague and overbroad. Now, the overbroad definition of this proposed crime of hate speech is essentially that any expression that causes substantial emotional, psychological, physical, social, or economic harm, and that at the same time, promotes and propagates hatred against a group of people specifically listed in the bill is hate speech. Okay, so, I mean, already here we can see that harm has various grounds in it, and this is one of the problems because the bill's definition of harm is too wide. In fact, much wider than the constitutional court's definition of harm in so-called civil hate speech cases in terms of the Equality Act. Now, just for viewers, a civil law like the Equality Act, you can get, be given a slap on the wrist and be told to pay a fine by the court and ordered to apologize. But you haven't committed a crime and you're not going to go to jail and get a criminal record. However, when it comes to a criminal law, you will get a criminal record and you will go to jail. And this is what this bill proposes. It proposes a very wide definition of hate speech with a wide definition of harm. Hate is undefined and an expanded list of grounds. And it proposes sending you to jail for up to eight years. Now, common sense and legal tradition dictate that it should be more difficult to convict you of the crime than to tell you you need to apologize in terms of the civil law. And this is one of the reasons the bill is problematic. Because of the wider definition of harm, it's easier to go to jail up to eight years in terms of this bill than to be ordered to apologize in terms of the Civil Equality Act. Now, another glaring problem, Liesl, is that the definition of hate speech obviously requires hate, okay? But the bill mm -hmm. has no definition of what hatred is. So we've got this very wide definition of harm and we have hate, which is undefined, an expanded list of grounds. And again, all of this is very bizarre because the Constitutional Court has very clearly explained what hatred entails in the seminal case of John Quirlani. And also because international hate speech laws and guidance documents on these laws provide definitions for hate and hatred. So not only do we have definitions to draw from internationally, but even in the South African context, our own Concord has endorsed definitions for hatred. So this is already bad but it gets even worse. And Lisa, I will leave it up to you to explain to our listeners why it gets worse. How does it get worse than having a hate speech law that wants to um, criminalize hate speech but doesn't tell anyone what hate is? Yeah, and then to boot, you can go to jail for up to eight years. Well, let's start off by the extended list of grounds. So these are specific um, groups of people that are protected. Um now, the bill includes a very long list of grounds for hate speech, basically um, protected groups of people, and they share certain identifiable characteristics. And the list goes much wider than the Constitution and even includes some grounds that are not even in the Equality Act. And of course, as we said, the Equality Act deals with civil hate speech. Now, some of these grounds are highly controversial, and the meaning of, of what these grounds are are quite fluid. For example, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, sex characteristics. These are perhaps novel and in evolving terms. And the bill does not 
uh, provide any definitions to assist us. And we're talking about criminal law. So definitions are very important with criminal laws. Then there is the definition of who a victim is. Who can be a victim of hate speech? Now, if you couple this with the fact that according to the bill, a, a victim of hate speech can be even a family member or a person associated with a group of protected persons or even a juristic company, a person, for example, a company or organization, very uh, troubling questions arise. For example, say a person boycotts a company um, and encourages others also to boycott that company, and they do this via Facebook. Now, this was what was done by various religious leaders um, concerning, concerning Woolworths during Pride Month. Um, and on the face on it, of it, according to this bill at least, you could argue that, well, this looks like economic harm against a protected, a protected group of persons. Um, so if the bill was already law, the question arises, and this is a serious question, uh, would these religious leaders have been guilty of hate speech? And we need to seriously grapple with these questions before this bill becomes a law, because it's going to affect real people. Then we come to the distribution of hate speech. So even if you are not the person who actually committed the hate speech, somebody else made a post, somebody else said something, it was recorded, but you share this clip or recording, in whichever form it is, with someone else. You share it on social media. You can also be found guilty of hate speech. Um, you can also end up in jail. So in our example about the religious leaders um, who protested against Woolworths and called, called for a boycott, uh, they posted this on Facebook. So what if you share these posts on Facebook or you share it via WhatsApp? This is distribution of, of potentially of hate speech. Are you going to end up in jail? And then, Danila, you mentioned that the bill, this is a criminal law. The Equality Act is a civil law, also deals with hate speech. But crimes are more serious than civil offenses. That's what common sense dictates. So it's ironic that you, the way that the bill is currently worded would be easier for you potentially to be found guilty of criminal hate speech, end up in jail for up to eight years, as we said, than to be found guilty of civil hate speech under the Equality Act, where sanctions for civil hate speech include apologizing or paying compensation, but definitely not a criminal record and jail time. So that's also an anomaly that needs to be sorted out. Now, is there no protection, Daniela, uh, for well-made religious expression. Uh, freedom of religion, after all, is a protected fundamental right in the South African constitution. So is bona fide religious speech protected? What is the situation? Yes, well, that's a very good question, especially in light of that example of yours with the religious leaders um, in June this year, June 2023, calling for the boycott of Woolies. And I mean, in the example you cited, you have the first element of economic harm. No one knows what hate is because the bill fails to define hate, even though hatred has already been, um, definitions for hatred have already been endorsed by the Constitutional Court. And it's against various groups of people listed in the bill. So it's a very valid question that it depends on who sits on the court bench to decide what hate is. And you have no idea whether or not you committed a crime beforehand, which again goes against the very foundations of our constitutional democracy, which state that the rule of law is one of the founding values of our country. And the rule of law requires that the law is clear. So people know beforehand whether or not they're breaking it. But that aside, you asked about religious exemption clauses. So in terms of um, the religious exemption clause in the bill, would these religious leaders who called for boycotts of Woolies in June, would they have been exempted? But would, and, and, and an additional question is, would the person who have distributed that speech have been exempted? So unfortunately, the bill only provides very narrow and in Forest A's opinion, self-defeating grounds for exempting constitutionally protected religious expression, as well as artistic, academic and journalistic expression. And this is why the bill is a major threat to religious freedom. Now, religious freedom concerns include that the bill in its current form can potentially be weaponized to target, arrest, prosecute, and even imprison people of faith simply for pro uh, professing traditional views that are no longer politically correct. Again, as we said, um, 
The problem with wanting to criminalize hate speech but not telling anyone what hate is, is that you don't end up criminalizing true hate speech. You end up criminalizing speech that certain people hate. Now, this has been the case in several European nations where similar hate speech legislation is in force. The current so-called religious exemption clause is simply not strong enough um, to guarantee an individual's right to freedom of religious expression. And it has been the subject of multiple interpretations um, due to the bad drafting. It's also circular lethal, and therefore it's self-defeating because basically it says that Liesl Pretorius isn't guilty of hate speech unless she's guilty of hate speech. Now, the only thing that is really excluded by the exemptions is harmful speech. But because the bill's definition of harm is vague and overbroad, again, it includes nebulous concepts such as social harm, um, concepts that have no place really in criminal law, like economic harm. Um, so because harm is so widely defined and catches so much in its net, and because hatred is undefined, so there is not even a net, um, and because the extended list of people that are protected is wider than the list in the Constitution and the Equality Act, this exemption boils down to very little, if any, practical protection. Which brings me to a very important question, Diesel. Where in the lawmaking process is the bill? Well, the bill is already for the National Council of Provinces. That's Parliament's second house. So this means it's already been passed by the first house of Parliament. And it's before a committee called the Select Committee on Security and Justice. Now, this committee has already invited public comment, both in written and oral form. We participated in that process. And the Department of Justice has briefed the Select Committee on the public comments received. This means that the department went through all the public input and provided its responses to the committee. Now, we, as far as I are concerned, that the department basically shot down the public input, um, despite, despite broad um, stakeholder agreement, for example, on such um, issues such as hatred should be defined, because even in, in relation to civil law, the constitutional court has quoted you know, definitions for hatred that can be used to give meaning to that term. So that, that is concerning. There are positive developments, though. Um, the Democratic Alliance Honorable Mikulakis, who sits on the Select Committee, has tabled a document which contains proposals to improve the bill. This includes defining hatred and strengthening the exemption clause. In a recent parliamentary meeting, other MPs have called for the, uh, the jail term to be reduced. But now it's up to the committee to sit and deliberate and decide which of those amendments they incorporate into the bill. And of course, we will continue to monitor these developments closely. If the select committee adopts the bill as is, then the bill will go to a plenary sitting of the National Council of Promises. That means all the members sit together, they vote. And if they pass the bill, then basically it can go to the president for signature. But if the committee makes significant changes to the bill, um, for and this is what we're hoping for, in order that the bill can be approved, it needs to be sent back to the National Assembly so they can have a look at those changes as well. Uh, the committee actually plans to meet this week to adopt the bill, but we hope that there will be a very robust deliberation process and that the committee will take the suggestions made by the public of South Africa to heart and improve this hate speech bill. Nobody is condoning hate speech, but we definitely do not want a hate speech bill that criminalizes speech that is not hate speech, speech that should is uh, speech that should be constitutionally protected, should remain unprotected, because the right to freedom of expression is so vital to any democratic society, especially ours. So if listeners, uh, for more information, we invite listeners to go to our website, orsa.org.za, and sign up for our newsletter, or you can visit our Freedom of Religion essay Facebook page or YouTube channel, where you can learn more about the hate speech bill and other important matters that affect faith and freedom in South Africa. This is Michael Swain of 4SA. Remember to like and share this video, and then click on the subscribe button to make sure that you never miss our video updates on vital religious freedom issues.